Board. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. My name is Meg Sheehan, and I'm coordinator for the North American Mega Dam Resistance Alliance, a volunteer led group whose mission is to protect rivers and their communities. Welcome to part three of our three part webinar series on why importing more Canadian hydroelectricity is a bad deal for New York and frontline communities. Our two prior webinars on this topic are posted on our YouTube channel, on Facebook, and on our website. In those webinars, we heard from a range of community members impacted by Canadian hydropower imports on both sides of the border. We heard from an Indigenous community member from Labrador and from a resident of Rockland County who will be impacted by the Champlain Hudson Power Express Transmission Corridor running through her town. I'll do a little bit of Zoom webinar protocols. Um, so we'll be showing slides. If you're on a phone line and you'd like us to email those to you, please let us know. We have a helpline that you can either call by phone or text if you're having any problems with the webinar itself or with Zoom or would like to get in touch with us. During the webinar, we will have the chat box open if you have any questions. We're going to try to keep the questions to the end um, rather than trying to answer them while we're talking uh, for the speakers. That's a lot easier but you can use the chat box to put your question in at the end or just raise your hand. We've provided some resource background documents relevant to the topics we'll be discussing this evening. Those are in a Google Drive folder. There's the link there and we'll be, we'll be putting that in the chat box as well. We'll be recording this on Zoom and we'll be live streaming it on Facebook. We hope to end around 8.30 and well, we want to try to respect our speaker's time. Today, we will be hearing from this line of, lineup of speakers, which you saw in your invitation. I will be providing an overview and we'll be talking about Blackstone Group's proposed 330 mile Chippy or Champlain Hudson Power Express Transmission Corridor which will run from the Canadian border through the Adirondack State Park under the Hudson River to Astoria, Queens to deliver up to 1,250 megawatts of hydroelectricity from large dams and reservoirs in Canada to New York City. This is being imported under the false pretense that this electricity is clean and green and will help slow the climate crisis. Chippy will negatively impact the Hudson River itself and communities in New York. 60% of the line from the Canadian border, or about 190 miles, will, re will require destructive dredging under the iconic Lake Champlain and the Hudson River in order to bury this high voltage direct current cable. Our webinar will explain how Hydro-Quebec's electricity harms the environment and indigenous communities in Canada, and how using New York's waterways as energy highways negatively affects navigation in the river and river ecology. To provide some background, Hydro-Quebec and Nalcor Energy are both operating together in Eastern Canada. They are crown corporations or state-owned monopolies. Between them, they have 63 large hydro facilities, huge uh, mega dams and reservoirs covering up to 1,000 to 2,000 square miles just for the reservoir. This map is simply intended to give an overview of the scale of the distances that we are talking about. So we're talking about importing hydroelectricity over 1,200 miles to New York City over these long distance transmission cables from remote parts of Canada, from James Bay in the east, uh, west, and over in the west from 
the Upper Churchill Falls Dam in Labrador, where Hydro-Quebec gets one sixth of its electricity. And then on the Romaine River, Hydro-Quebec is building four new mega dams and a new transmission corridor, all intended for export to the United States. Here, we have just an overview of a slide from one of our allies in Canada from the Grand River Keeper, who has been fighting the Muskrat Falls Mega Dam on the Grand River. But this gives you an idea of the scale of these operations, the power lines running from Churchill Falls in Labrador to Quebec in order to supply so-called clean electricity to the United States. You can see the small wood reservoir in the back that is visible from space and covers over a thousand square miles. This is one of the world's largest hydroelectric facilities. The corridors that are being planned are four of them, two of them crossing under Lake Champlain. We have the Champlain Hudson Power Express to New York, the New England Clean Energy Connect, Clean Energy Power Link, also coming from Quebec under Lake Champlain over to Ludlow, Vermont to serve Boston. We have the Granite State Power Link, which is on hold for the moment, but we really don't know the future of that. We also have the very controversial New England Clean Energy Connect, which will run from Eastern Quebec down to through over the Canadian border in Maine, through Maine's iconic wilderness and down to a switching station on the coast of Maine. This corridor is extremely highly controversial and is facing a citizen referendum because of the opposition and that will be put to a public vote on a statewide ballot in November. So you can see that Hydro-Quebec has grand plans for importing a lot of electricity to the United States. This is a map, a, a more close up map of the Vermont's New England Clean Energy Link, Clean Power Link going over to Ludlow, Vermont to serve Boston. And this will again run parallel under Lake Champlain next to the Chippy Line. And I want to talk about the destruction of the environment, rivers, and communities in Canada for a quick uh, moment. I really can't cover the entire scale of the damage that has been caused, but it's safe to say that over the last 100 years, these state-owned monopolies, Hydro-Quebec and Nalcor Energy, have laid waste to hundreds of thousands of square miles of carbon sequestering boreal forests destroyed rivers, biodiversity, caused chemical water pollution, erosion, thermal water pollution, killed fisheries, and displaced people from their homes and ancestral land, lands. New dams are being built in Quebec for export. The Muskrat Falls Dam is nearing completion in Labrador, and a third dam is planned on the Churchill River or Grand River at Gull Island in Labrador. 22 new dams are planned across Canada. It is all being greenwashed as clean energy. In addition to subsidies from the Canadian government in the form of um, marketing support and um, loan guarantees and the like, the Canadian hydroelectric industry is seeking to qualify its dirty electricity for subsidies here in the United States. There's an active investigation due to the unfair competition presented by Canadian hydropower in front of the US Trade Commission under the section 332 of the Tariff Act and NAMRA is actively involved in that process. One of the things, in addition to its status as state -owned, a state-owned monopoly that gives Hydro-Quebec an unfair advantage over U.S.-based renewables and that allows Hydro-Quebec to make a case for obtaining clean energy subsidies in the U.S. 
is greenwashing. Greenwashing, it's dirty energy to obtain a marketing edge and to get these subsidies. As we will show, and as the evidence shows, this electricity is not renewable. The climate benefits are not documented or even credible in, or at, in the least. Hydro-Quebec misrepresents its relations with Indigenous communities, falsely claims that it's not building any new dams and that exports will be supplied with surplus water. And most of all, it claims that it will decarbonize the grid when in fact the construction and operation of these dams emits greenhouse gases. And this is important to note because Hydro-Quebec has no way to document the direct emissions from its dam. There is a carbon accounting loophole and many greenhouse gas inventories and even the UN's own international frameworks that does not require accounting for direct emissions from hydropower production. Hydro-Quebec has done its own studies that show methane, carbon, and nitrous oxide emissions from some of its dams. They're all potent greenhouse gas pollutants. The studies are mere snapshots in time. Hydro-Quebec has no continuous monitoring of its emissions or data to show the ongoing and historical emissions from its power. The studies that they do cite on their website and in various forums average the emissions from these reservoirs and dam operations over a one to 200 year time frame. That time frame is useless for the climate crisis when we are in a climate emergency and need to reduce our emissions now. What the available data does show, and this is some of Hydro-Quebec's own research and the only research that is available on this topic has been analyzed thoroughly by Dr. Brad, Brad Hager from MIT. What it does show is that one of Hydro-Quebec's largest dams has greenhouse gas emissions twice that of a coal-fired power station. Two of its largest dams, now over 40 years old, have carbon footprints about equal to a modern natural gas-fired power station. Both of these dams, they're the two largest again, it's the Churchill Dam that I showed you and the La Grande Dam on the James Bay, were both built without environmental study or any greenhouse gas emissions accounting. What this means is that given this available data, it is very unlikely that Canadian hydropower will help any of the US states reduce their greenhouse gas emissions. A serious concern that we have with New York's Climate Action Plan is that the State Energy Research and Development Authority and the Climate Action Council issued a report on clean energy in 2020 portraying Canadian hydro as zero emissions and an important part of the pathway to decarbonization of the energy economy. It is clear that it is not zero carbon, most of it is on par with fossil fuels, according to re recent data and peer-reviewed science, and it certainly is not going to get the U.S. to zero emissions. Hydro can be as dirty as fossil fuels, and there's no documentation to support the claims in New York's report. We are in a climate emergency. We need emission, emissions cuts now that must be verifiable and credible. There's no time for shell games with carbon and carbon accounting, but that is exactly what Hydro-Quebec is playing with its greenhouse gas emissions and climate impacts of its dams. I'd be happy to answer questions in the Q&A if you have any further um, inquiries you'd like to make about any of these topics. But for now, I will turn it over to our next speaker, Eric Johansson. Eric is Professor of Marine Transportation at SUNY Maritime and a distinguished service professor in the field of marine transportation. And we're gonna switch over to screen sharing. I will stop screen sharing. 
if I can do this. Good evening, everyone. Um, it's a, thank you for this opportunity to speak today. Uh, my speech, my it will be more on maritime framework for cables and pipelines in, in navigable waters. So we'll start off with a little discussion. So historically, cables and pipelines run perpendicular to a navigation channel. They're clearly marked on our charts, and they're either buried very deep or horizontally directional drill to minimize minimize navigation risk. The two methods that are predominantly used are horizontal directional drilling and jet plow. Um, following a cable or pipeline's uh, useful life, uh, they are typically abandoned in the water where they lay. And uh, uh, I, I always found that interesting, uh, which I only just found out recently. Um, horizontal directional drilling is a uh, very good method of uh, Putting in a cable under a, a navigable channel, um, it is expensive, but uh, it has no impacts on the uh, waterways, and uh, it is used a lot of times where there's environmentally sensitive areas, uh, or if they are going underneath the federal navigation channel, or uh, for other reasons as well, like crossing other utility lines as well. Um, this is uh, the one method that is used. The second method is what they call jet plow. And jet plow is uh, basically they, they tow a plow behind a vessel. The vessels, uh, uh, the plow that's being towed behind a vessel uh, will jet in water to make a trench. And then the cable is sunk into the trench. It's usually about seven feet they can get this into. It has to be an unconsolidated sediment. So it cannot be into rock. Um, and it is a method that is used mostly in areas where there is not uh, uh, navigable waters uh, uh, for uh, this purpose. What we're going to see next is uh, uh, an area in lower New York Bay where they actually use both methods. So in the areas that are not navigable waters, they use jet plow, and in the waters that are navigable waters, they use the horizontal directional drilling. You'll see there's the major channels here where they went way underneath so that there would be no impacts to navigation uh, safety. As you can also see, they uh, had to run this cable. They, they want to do this as short as possible. So it starts at a point of origin and goes to its destination in the quickest possible manner. Uh, in, in this instance, that's uh, the way they did it. And you also can notice that there's one alongside the other. Um, and that was because they bundled them together to keep the, the risks uh, lower uh, for all that were involved to keep them uh, close together so people knew where they were. Um, there's a group in, in the, uh, in the uh, um, Europe called OSPAR. They are uh, uh, dedicated to protecting, conserving the Northeast Atlantic and its resources. I urge you to go to their website, it's fantastic. Uh, they have documented uh, cable routing recommendations, which include that uh, uh, when routing a cable, you should consider protected areas, environmentally sensitive or valuable areas with habitat, sensitive species, physical disturbance, where the cable laying activity or operation will result in adverse effects or should be avoided. More importantly, it says that the cable should be the shortest possible length. You know, this is not the case with these cables uh, whatsoever. Bundled with existing cables, uh, and we'll talk a little bit about that in a second. And also minimal number of crossings with other cables or pipelines to reduce the number of crossing structures, which we were able to do with those other two in the lower bay of New York Harbor. So why are we concerned? Well. As I said earlier, most cables are perpendicular to a channel, shortest distance possible, very deep, no impact in navigation safety. Companies have now chosen to run cables parallel to channels because it's less expensive to do this than running it on land side. So the first one done was in New Haven, Connecticut. It didn't actually run in the channel, it ran right outside of the channel. However, years later, when they had to dredge the harbor, 
It was a very, very difficult and lengthy uh, process to get the cable company to agree to pick up the cable so that they could redredge and reinstall the cable, which required that there be a secondary uh, disturbance of the bottom in order to relay the cable. The second cable this was done with that we're aware of was in California. Um, they did fight it out there, but capitulated it and said, all right, do it. You say it's not going to bother us. And within one year, a ship coming into the port, the MV Ocean Life, uh, uh, lost engines. They dropped their first anchor, which fouled on the cable, rendering it useless. They dropped the second anchor, stopping the ship just before a railroad bridge took a direct hit. I encourage you to read the, the court case. You'll see uh, what this is, uh, uh, where this is all going. Um, the third known parallel case is the Chippy case, uh, a cable. And uh, the Energy Subcommittee, which I'm the chair of, has been working with them uh, since 2008 to try to develop a non-regulatory solution uh, that could meet their needs and our needs. And uh, we were never able to come to a conclusion and the only one since 2008, we have not been able to uh, uh, agree upon. Uh, so what are our concerns? Well, obviously the routing going into navigable waters is the number one. Uh, the burial depths, because they would like to bury it only seven feet, we're not pleased about that. But even at seven feet, there's many places they will not be able to bury it at all. Uh, and that's where they are planning to use levee mattresses. Uh, levee mattresses originally designed to hold back the levees by the Army Corps engineers in the Western Rivers are being utilized by them to protect their cable. However, it also creates an anchor snag issue for navigation safety. Plus in the Hudson River, you don't know if it's gonna be staying in the same place as we know the currents are very strong. They'll be using this when they are crossing existing cables and pipelines. And I've been told, and I can't confirm this, but there is approximately 130 of them that go perpendicular in the river. They also are going to need to use this in areas that have consolidated sediments, which is rock. Um, uh, and there's a lot of rock in the Hudson River. So um, a lot of the times the cable will be very near to the surface, which will come into play when we talk about the environmental concerns as well as the navigation concerns. This is what the CHIPI proposal had looked like. And in the beginning, when we first met with them, we had suggested that they use secondary channels no longer uh, used in the industry. Uh, that would be the, the line to the, the yellow line with the red. Um, but what happened in the beginning where the river was wide open for cables running down the state of New York uh, decided to make uh, the majority of the Hudson River exclusion zones, but they have no control of the federal channel. So that pushed the, can the, uh, the cable into the federal navigation channel. So this is where we are still at angst over this. And as you can see, um, you know, they, that's where they need to go, but they are uh, not pleasing us uh, for sure. Um, so what are some of the impacts of it being near or in the channel? Uh, anchor strikes. So if we are able, if we have to drop an anchor in an emergency uh, and we strike the cable, the uh, financial responsibility for the damages lies on us, not on the cable owner. So that is a unfair advantage uh, for our industry. Uh, anchor snag, uh, you saw in the previous uh, uh, example of the MV Ocean Life that's fouled on the cable. Well, can you imagine now just not a narrow cable, but these heavy concrete mattresses laying on top? That will also foul the cable as well. Um, you know, seven feet, we're told, is deep enough. Uh, we say no. So, you know, there are two scientific reports that collaborate that when an anchor is dropped in an emergency, it goes a lot further than seven feet. So the first was uh, Malcolm Sharple's report that was written for Bohm. Uh, anchor penetration, he calculated to be uh, 15 feet. And several years later, Dr. Charles Albany, who's an expert on this, uh, testified in the uh, Trans Bay Ocean Life case that anchor penetration varies between 12 and 20 feet. Uh, the Towing Safety Advisory Committee, which is a federal advisory committee, wrote Report 1304, which also advised not to run cables and pipelines parallel to navigable waters 
or use the levee mattresses to protect the cable. When you think about it, they protect the cable, but if it gets struck, who has to pay to have it fixed? So we are concerned because in the Hudson River, there is only one federally designated anchorage uh, on the chart that holds only three vessels. However, we have had custom and practice anchorages uh, known to our industry and actually memorialized in uh, navigation books uh, almost a decade old. Uh, these are areas that we have designated uh, to anchor in the event of uh, some sort of an emergency. So whether it's a maneuvering casualty, like a loss of engines, a loss of steering, mostly in the Hudson River, it's restricted visibility. You've been on the Hudson, you know, it's always foggy in the Hudson River uh, or they have big storms. And we have selected these areas because these are areas that allow us a safe haven in order to bypass um, the uh, uh, you know, weathering out the storm, which we don't want to be in that river navigating in bad weather. Um, and I will tell you, when I was a young man and a captain on a tug, we went in all kinds of weather. Companies are very safety conscious. They give master's discretions to anchor when they feel needed. And as a result, our safety record has been exemplary in the last few years. Over 10 years or more, uh, not a single incident, uh, and we'll not put on that one. Uh, the anchorage areas in the Hudson River are also used for safe havens. During Superstorm Sandy, there was over 60 units that anchored up there uh, during the storm to protect their crew and their vessels from the dangers of the storms. And in the Northeast, or not long ago, there was two that one winter, we had at the same time, almost 50, 60 units up there. Not a single complaint was alleged, alleged uh, was uh, uh, brought up during those times, by the way, by anybody. All right. And, you know, when we're anchoring for visibility, what everybody has to understand is that when we anchor for visibility, we have to make money. So when that visibility clears, we leave. And that's what we do. Sometimes we stay a little longer if there's an issue with a pier or some other issue, but to, mostly we are getting out and getting moving. Um, so it's very important to understand that as, as well. These are very important for navigation safety. Uh, environmental impacts, and some of this is uh, in the TDI funded reports and other I had found in uh, OSPAR's uh, 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 report. And OSPAR is the, uh, uh, it stands for the Oslo uh, uh, Paris uh, group, they have uh, uh, several nations involved to protect the environment, as I said earlier, their statement. Uh, and these are some, so contamination impacts. So when they are jet plowing, that you're going to have the release of harmful substance or nutrients uh, uh, that'll be suspended uh, and, uh, you know, they'll be in the water. And of course, if there is a uh, uh, um, uh, compromise on the uh, the cable, there's the a chance of the insulation fluid leaking, which happened in a cable in the lower Hudson River that did run per perpendicular to the channel a couple years ago. Uh, electromagnetic impacts, uh, very well known that uh, magnetic fields are generated by these power cables and impair the orientation of fish. Now, this is what they are saying, OSPAR, uh, in marine mammals and affect migratory behaviors more importantly to us on navigation safety is that the TDI funded report had said that it would deviate compasses of ships, which are several uh, feet above the water. So if it's doing that, it's uh, pretty strong. And uh, if you look at their report at one meter burial, it's, it's significant. And at seven feet, it's a little less, but it's still pretty significant. Um, a one I, I just uh, came up with uh, and found out the other day is uh, reef impacts. Uh, when a cable is buried by itself, it will collect uh, uh, organisms that will develop a reef. And sometimes it's not the natural community that's doing this. Uh, and when you want to consider the, um, uh, the mattresses as that, that would be a big concern to us because if the reef develops up, that reduces the underkeel clearance, which uh, prevents us from navigating uh, up the river as well. Uh, also, the thermal impacts, uh, you know, it will give off thermal impacts. And of course, the closer it is to the surface, the more thermal impacts 
it will release. So these are some very strong environmental impacts that all come out of that report. Now you have the references if anybody would like to read through them as well. Um, so where are we with this proposal? Well, they're gonna bury it at seven feet where able. They're gonna do it on top of these perpendicular crossings uh, where they can't. And that's, uh, as I said earlier, almost 130 of them approximate what we've been told. Um, and then of course they can't do it across any type of uh, a rock area where it will need to be laid on the top and buried also as well. So we would like to see uh, some differences here. We'd like to see the burial depths and the cable routing in navigable waters done differently. Burial depths have to be greater than 15 feet. Cables should be routed outside of navigable waters and certainly outside of custom and practice anchorages. Um, an anchor strike come on a submarine cable bears the financial burden again on the vessel owner as opposed to the cable or pipeline owner. So maybe perhaps the cable uh, company would like to assume that financial risk um, and say they'll take it on themselves, but they won't they won't do that because why would they? So that's a concern of ours, but that will never be, uh, I'm sure, realized because it, they won't take that risk. Um, these are the references that I have used, and I would hope anyone who is uh, willing to uh, to read these uh, is very important. So you got the Oz Park Commission uh, report, you got Dr. Malcolm Sharple's report, which was written for the Bureau of Offshore Energy Management that says it's up to 15 feet. Um, the Transbay Cable LLC versus MV Ocean Life uh, testimony, which uh, Dr. Albany had then said that it was between 12 and 20 feet, and he's a lead, leading expert. You can read the navigation risk assessment that was put together by TDI, funded by TDI, who's the company that is uh, putting in the uh, Champlain Hudson Power Express cable. You can read the magnetic fields from the Champlain Hudson Power Express transmission project modeling and additional cable configurations. Also a report funded by TDI, which then shows all of this uh, uh, electromagnetic uh, pollution as well. And the Tony Safety Advisory Committee uh, report 1304. So, in, in the long run, uh, we have never been able to uh, uh, come to a routing that pleased the industry, certainly not a burial depth, and the concrete mattresses are certainly nothing that we can approve of, not designed to cover pipelines or cables, and a certain risk to uh, anchor snag and a certain risk to uh, reef uh, uh, impacts uh, as we are now finding out by the uh, the OSPAR Commission report. So, uh, so we're against any cable coming down this river or any river uh, uh, in navigable waters. So uh, I wish to thank you for your time and I thank everyone for their uh, patience with me. Thank you. Am I supposed to ask any questions now? We'll take questions and answers at the end. Thank you very much. And um, that was extremely informative. And we'll jump right now to our next speaker. And that is Eric Jackman from the Hudson River Keeper in New York. I'm trying to. So, George Jackman, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is George Jackman. I'm the uh, Senior Habitat Restoration Manager at Riverkeeper. And my, my main interest or my main occupation at uh, Riverkeeper is dam removal. So this, this project has a lot of meaning to me. And uh, Riverkeeper is vehemently opposed to hydropower. So let me begin. You know, uh, what can I could say about hydropower? Hydropower are the hydropower dams are the only form of renewable energy that are sending species to extinction and displacing and poisoning people while also contributing to climate change. 
So as Meg said before, climate change is not green, nor is it green. The problem with dams is that they disrupt the flow and function of rivers by modifying how they work and how they flow. And they disrupt the sediment transport. They alter the water quality. And they also sever biological community. Rivers flow, dams block that flow. So dams don't just block a flow, they block nutrients, they block minerals, and they block sediments. All of these are critically important to food chains along the rivers. And there's a continuum along a river. And every time you put a dam in that river, you put a reset button on that river and you have to start it all over again. It's like borrowing on your, your 457 or you know 401k. If you keep borrowing on it, there'll be nothing left. So I also want to talk about the Hudson River ecology. You know, I could expound at length on dams, but we've already heard about dams and their effect. And I could answer any questions later on. But what's really critically important is how this cable could affect the Hudson River's ecology. It's critical to know that the Hudson River is the second largest spawning ground and fish nursery on the east coast of the United States. When, you know, the first explorers came to this country, they remarked at how vast or, the, uh, or teeming, the water was teeming with an infinitude of fish. And the Hudson is critically important for a wide variety of species. Many of them are commercial species. However, for all its importance, the Hudson River is once again being asked to subsidize human whim despite centuries of abuse and neglect. The Hudson River was the engine that made the Empire State great. And it, in that process, it suffered a lot of abuse and neglect. And it is time that we give the river a break. The Hudson River currently holds the shameful distinction of the country's largest Superfund site. And equally sad is the fish in the river are no longer suitable for human consumption. There have been, you know, there, uh, there are PCBs in the fish. So you're not allowed to eat legally. You're not supposed to eat the fish in the river. And there are subsistence pe people or subsistence fishermen that eat these fish. They are giving themselves a potential dose of PCBs. And worst of all, <clears throat> the most iconic Hudson River fish species are in decline. And most of these fish are just mere shadows of their former abundance. And we have two species of sturgeons, and both of them are endangered because they were over-harvested. You know, in the 1880s, it was called black gold, their caviar. But the, the Hudson River is different from a lot of rivers because it is a very turbid river and it, it imports what we call alloctonous sediments, sediments that come from the watershed. So the river is light limited with little to no light at depths deeper than 10%, uh, 10 feet. So if you're a fish and you cannot see you, in this featureless medium, how do you navigate? And that's a great question. The fish have a, this amazing ability, especially those that are long distance migrants, that they use the Earth's magnetic field, which allows them to determine their position and medium uh, in a medium that provides few landmarks. That might be incredible until you understand it is believed that birds can even see the Earth's uh, geomagnetic fields. But what we know is experimental data demonstrates that various taxa of fish can use the Earth's uh, magnetic fields for orientation and navigation, much like birds do. So how do fish do that? They have this uh, electrosensory systems and they can perceive magnetic fields via these electroreceptors. And they're very, very highly attuned to these fields. What this has done is it provides fish 
with or all migratory creatures with a built-in mapping compass. Essentially, they have a GPS. They can tell where they are and where they need to go. And if you want to know how amazing that is, fish like paddlefish, we have one paddlefish. We just had a paddlefish that went extinct in, in China. We have, there's one paddlefish left in the world and it's in the United States. Paddlefish have this long rostrum. They can detect just movements of zooplankton uh, swimming in the water column. That's how, just swimming they can detect it. That's how sensitive it is. But sturgeon also have this. They have electro uh, receptive senses to locate their prey. They can detect prey crawling in the substrate. Now you gotta realize they cannot see in this light limited environment and nor, and they, but they can perceive below the sediments. And in this light limited environment, they can navigate and exhibit, but they will also exhibit altered behavior in the presence of electromagnetic fields. Back in 2011, after this, this whole thing, uh, this chippy cable was proposed, a study was commissioned to examine these, the impacts of this cable. And it was concluded at the time that the impacts to the Hudson River and its organisms would be minimal. However, things have changed somewhat. In that time, we have seen a continued decline of, as I mentioned, some of the most iconic fish and have, with extreme historical importance have been in consistent decline. And all simultaneously, significant strides have been made in scientific research with regard to electromagnetic fields and their impact upon aquatic organisms. So we have this cable that's going to, the chippy cable will enter the Hudson River, River at Quimans and extend 118 miles southwards to the city of Yonkers. Subsequently, we've come to believe that a closer scrutiny of chippy is warranted at a concern that EMF may negatively impact species that are becoming increasingly imperiled. Also, PCB sampling has not been carried out. And we know there are pockets of PCBs below the federal dam, and they're gonna just cut right through this potentially and resuspend them. So there's a lot of uncertainty with these PCB impacts as they become resuspended during deployment of the cable. Here's something that was never studied, and it concerns me, is what we call anthropogenic noise. The shads and the river herring these are forage fishes. They have um, a, their, their swim bladder is connected to the hearing. And what it does is it acts like a drum and it allows them to perceive noise at a farther distance. It's wonderful when whales and dolphins are clicking, you can perceive that. But what are the impacts of the noise on a fish that is very, very sensitive. And plus it, it's extremely, if you look at cross-eyed at, at, at a, a herring, they'll, they'll die of fright. Everything wants to eat them and they're scared of everything. There is an overall lack of knowledge regarding the, the, the impacts of these power cables on the marine, and estuarine and diadromous species. And there are, we have hundreds of fish in the Hudson River estuary. The main concern is that EMFs generated by these power cables will impact the normal and migrational movements and alter the behavior of fish and other species. And what, what we have, we have a lot of uncertainty. And with so many of our species uh, in decline and showing little rebound, it's, we are concerned. For instance, in 20 of the past 21 years, American shad have experienced recruitment failures. We have lost 60% of their spawning habitat. They are not coming back and neither are the river herring. So, and, tour, and they're not even listed yet. 
And two of our species, American eels, are in decline and are in long-term decline. And two of our species, as mentioned, are on the endangered species list. So what do we know about EMF that is so troubling? Well, so you want to put a cable into the water. Well, all types of electrical cables will emit EMF into the surrounding water. Once you run a, a cable, electricity through a cable, you will induce magnetic fields. And then the magnetic fields also create what's called induced electric fields. And these induced currents may affect the behavior or the viability of aquatic organisms. Though, and though the magnetic fields can be contained within the cables, the magnetic fields around the cable are unavoidable, and those in turn in induce a secondary electric field, which can be detected by the fish. So you cannot eliminate these induced mag uh, fields, these induced magnetic fields or induced electric fields. Burying a cable will not reduce the strength of the magnetic field, it just removes it deeper. So yeah, I, I fully agree with Eric. Put it deeper if you're gonna put it in. Put it to 15 feet, put it, put it to 50 feet. My, you know, keep it away. Burying the cable helps, but fish can still detect these magnetic fields. And the problem is, if, 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 you were, if I brought you up to the Adirondacks and I monkeyed with your map or your compass, what could happen? You could get lost. And when your life depends on your, cap, your, your compass or your map, <laughs> you got a problem. And, but for a fish, these migrations are timed, or specifically timed to seasons when eons and eons of, uh, of selection have created uh, these adaptive pathways and by altering them or uh, causing other behavioral harm might impact these, uh, you know, these evolutionary successful strategies. Why is that a concern? We, because studies have shown that eels, lamprey, catfishes, sharks, rays, sturgeons, salmonids, tunas, herring, flatfishes, cods, in fact, most bony fishes, as well as marine mammals and turtles, are all highly sensitive to electric fields. In fact, some will even shy away from these electric fields produced by cables. EMF, EMFs may attract or repel sensitive species, which then can alter their behavior or their feeding routine or even worse, their reproductive tendencies, or their local movements, or even they've expended a lot of energy to come from the ocean, a lot of the migratory fish. They might have come 5,000 miles, and they're, they're aiming for a specific creek in the Hudson River. We might deter them from that. And what's even more important, the elasmobranchs, what we call the sharks, the rays, and the sturgeons, are extremely sensitive to uh, electromagnetic forces. And there are higher risk of these artificial uh, electromagnetic fields than non-electrosensitive species. They have this, what they call the ampule of Lorenzini, and it's on the bottom of their, their snout, and they can detect minute, minute changes. And that's why a hammerhead shark's hammerhead works. They're, they're cruising along the substrate. They can detect a fish buried in the sand just by moving. The biochemical changes in their muscles are detected. So now when you have a cable with a thousand megavolts running through it, how's it gonna affect the fish? I don't know. In fact, sharks are so sensitive, they've been known to exhibit aggressive behavior and attack the cable. They start biting the cables. But the most important point is we know that sturgeon are like shark, sharks. 
and they have been reported to alter their behavior in response to EMF. So consider this, out of an abundance of caution, the National Marine Fishery Service propo proposed critical habitat for the southern distinct population segment of the threatened green sturgeon along the coast, the west coast and along the coastline. And this uh, particular species, the, the southern DPS, is San Francisco Bay and it migrates up to the coast of Alaska. And NIMS, National Marine Fishery Service, created this migratory pathway along out, it's at 110 meters, all the way up to Alaska. Why? They created a safe passage or a migratory corridor for these fishes. Now, green sturgeon are only threatened. We have two species of sturgeon that are endangered. So, there was concern that these fishes might be altered by the EMF created during energy transmission. And there is concern that the magnetic fields created by the high voltage direct current may disrupt movements that are critical to the fish's behavior. In addition, research has shown that EMF affects the development, the organogenesis, or the development of organs within uh, creatures as they're developing, behavior, biochemistry, orientation, distribution, migration patterns, homeostasis, which means balance, and re further recruitment of fishes. In fact, another study of brown trout and rainbow trout exposed to low level magnetic fields showed that exposure to EMF slowed embryonic development. Again, organogenesis and circulation patterns in the fish embryos were altered. The larvae experienced anxiety and behavioral changes as well as disorientation. That was a study back in 98. And another concerning one for us, in San Francisco Bay, there was a study of Chinook salmon smolts. Smolts are small fish, uh, juveniles of the salmon, and the smolts start exiting the bay. So they did a test uh, of, uh, the, here the, um, the, 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 the cable's running perpendicular to where they have to go. So they have to cross the cable. And so they compared act cable activation versus uh, cable inactivity. And it was revealed that during cable act activation, there was a decrease of 11.1% of the smolts that were able to successfully exit the bay. And another study of uh, the European eel, Anguilla anguilla, they found that the magnetic fields generated by uh, high voltage direct current cables, they found that 60% of the eels crossed the cable. And they said, wow, it's not a barrier. But they never mentioned, where's the other 40%? We already have our eels in significant decline. They're already down 70 something percent. And not only that, they're infected by a Japanese parasite. We don't even know if they're making it back to the Sargasso Sea. And because of hydropower, they have lost one third of their range. That is directly due to hydropower up on the St. Lawrence River. So with so many populations of Hudson River species at extreme rock bottom, can we afford to lose another 11% of recruitment during out migrations? I think not. So if the cable disrupts spawning efforts, damages eggs, or impacts the young of year, the, the fish that are born that year, the larvae that just start growing, we won't know the consequences for years. And for the case of sturgeon, for many years, beyond 20 years, and probably more because they may defer spawning for 20 years. They're a long-lived fish. So 
It might be 20 to 40 years before we know if we have any impact on sturgeon since they are so slow to mature. At that time, the cable will be fully deployed or maybe, as Eric said, abandoned at that time. You know, it could have been used and abandoned. Who knows? But there would be no way to mitigate the damages to the impacted organisms once it's fully deployed. And Eric also talked about those buried mats. And P TDI says they'll create reef-like conditions. And they said the surface can, can develop an epibenthic community over time providing structure, like an oyster reef. Wouldn't that be nice? But do you really want to build an ecosystem on a thousand megavolt cable, high voltage, direct current cable, and hope that fish spawn and lay their eggs on top of it? Would you want to sleep on top of that cable? Would you want to take your newborn offspring and lay it on that cable? I think not. And that's what TDI is telling us to do. What is the long-term impact to those eggs or larvae? Now, there was also another case. Out of an abundance of caution, it is, I believe they want to move the cable out of Haver Straw Bay. They said because it's essential fish habitat. Well, Obviously, that's an indication that there could be something to worry about. But more importantly, the entire Hudson River is essential fish habitat for short-nosed sturgeon and Atlantic sturgeon. So if they say Havastraw Bay is sensitive, no, no, it's the entire river is sensitive. The entire river is essential fish habitat. But, they, it's, but by saying it should be removed out of Havastraw Bay, they are concerned about their own cable. What about the PCBs? Well, while you're gonna have to entrench and deploy this cable, the 2011 study found that it was, this activity was highly uncertain and that further sampling was needed to determine levels of toxins along the route. And there might be need to be adjustments in that route. Why? Because in the sediments of the Hudson River, there are PCBs, dioxin, mercury, cadmium, and strontium-90, and all at toxic levels. So cable deployment in an aquatic environment is a very complex process that requires highly specialized equipment. You need this graph now, some machine to clear the course, to move boulders out of the way and debris. But that's also natural habitat. And you're gonna stir up at that whole sediment. Now, the, the route includes 11 miles of bedrock. So you gotta lay mats over 11 miles of bedrock. 66 cables and pi pipelines will be crossed. And another 26 cables and pipelines will be crossed in the Harlem River. And then to deploy the, uh, the cable, they're going to use various techniques, dredging, trenching, or cutting wheels, or water jetting in the soft sediments. And what about maintenance of this cable? What if something goes wrong? How do they fix it? They got to redisturb these sediments that contain legacy industrial contaminants. So these contaminants become really resuspended into the food chain. And what that means is increasing quantity and toxicity of, of, uh, of contaminants are moved up by an order of 10 each link in the food chain, starting with plankton and ending with humans. Also, there are impacts to drinking water that could cause elevated levels of PCBs. Thank you, George. Um, we just want to allow enough time for our last speaker and sure. questions. I, I was just about finished. So that was really my, my, my last point. And 
so basically, as I said, all our, many of our, our, our shad and river herring are functionally depleted. Do you think laying a cable in the Hudson is a good idea? That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think Meg lost screen sharing, so um, we're going to move on to Will Nichols. And Will, if you wouldn't mind introducing yourself. Yes, no problems. Uh, my name is William Nichols. Um, I run the Nation magazine. Uh, it serves the uh, Cree people of James Bay. Um, I'm no stranger to Hydro-Quebec and what they say. Um, I was one of the uh, Crees who went down into Northeastern United States during the time that they were wanted to do the, uh, the Great Whale Project. And uh, the way it started out was me and a friend, we made t-shirts and uh, did designs on them. And we traveled around. We sold the t-shirts for gas money and food. And uh, eventually the Grand Council uh, started getting requests for us to come and speak. And, uh, then they hired me as, um, as basically one of the spokespeople and lobbyists for uh, Eastern United States. The words that Hydro-Quebec are saying to you now with the clean, safe energy, you know, et cetera, are the same words they've been using for the last 30 years. Nothing seems to have changed. They're also saying that um, basically they have a good relationship with the Aboriginal people, the Indigenous people of the areas, um, because we signed a treaty with them. However, that treaty was more or less forced upon us. Now, they're saying there are no impacts. Basically, they have very little impacts. What they don't tell you about the impacts was one of them, of course, is mercury contamination, which I'm sure you're all aware of. That is still ongoing. Um, Basically, pregnant women are told not to eat the fish. However, recently, uh, they're saying we should eat some fish because it's healthier than some other choices that we have. So that's one of our problems there. Um, basically, food is very expensive up north. And my territory is something that you would call a harsh environment compared to down south. The Crees who, the early Crees who first went into that territory who tried to live off the land, they're dead, they're gone. It was those Crees who learned to live as part of the land, they become part of it. They're the ones who survived mostly. So food sources are very important to us. And what happens to them? Well, I'll give you a first example. Because of the amount of roads that Hydro-Quebec built into our territory and all around, because those dams are huge. I mean, I, I've heard one statement saying that it's as large as the state of New York. It allowed a lot more hunters than that to come in, resulting in, for example, caribou, the George River herd. In the early 1990s, they were around 800,000. By 2018, 5,500. Think of that, down from 800,000 to 5,500. That's a fact. We tried requesting from the Quebec government to ban Hunting. Hunting was not banned until autumn 2017. Then, when you were talking about damming things, not bringing nutrients into certain areas, well, diverting the rivers and that affects eelgrass. Eelgrass is a food for geese. And now, geese are important to the Crees. How important? Well, there is a sign that life is going to be a little easier for us when they come back in the spring and we have our spring goose hunt. During that time, schools close down, 
businesses closed down, basically the band offices closed down and whatnot, communities look like ghost towns because everyone goes out onto the land taking their kids and we go goose hunting. And it's a very much a traditional thing. You know, when your child gets his first goose, there's a ceremony for that. So eelgrass requires certain salinity levels. By diverting the rivers, you've affected the salinity levels, meaning the geese are having a harder time finding food. That's a huge problem for us. That's taking away part of our tradition, it's taking away part of our subsistence food from the land. Food from the land is extremely important up north because of the high price of bringing in foodstuffs. I was in one of the communities along the coast of Skaganish, and I seen three peppers basically for $16. You know, think of that price difference from down here. Another problem is the shores of rivers and that are some of our most productive areas for biodiversity, for growth, for the animals and the plants. Well, these are shallow dams compared to what all of you are used to. And what happens with water fluctuations is, well, in the summer, you get kill zones because the water goes down that much. And sometimes there's, someone told me up to half a kilometer of just a dead zone of mud and that. And since it comes and fluctuates, plants can't grow there, etc. In the winter, well, when people use power, the water levels go down, creating air pockets underneath the ice. Sometimes those buckle. Sometimes those are very unsafe to go on. So the rivers and that that we used to have as our transportation routes are no longer as safe as they could be. You know, um, Lately, with this whole COVID thing, uh, Hydro-Quebec camps have been uh, termed as high-risk places by the Grand Council of the Crees. The reason being is they fly in people from Montreal, which at one point, Montreal was known as the seventh most deadly city in the world for daily deaths concerning COVID-19. They were flying in people into those camps without bothering for any testing or considerations thereof. In the past, Chisasmi now has a high ground parking lot. The reason is if any of those dams go, they will wipe out the town. And so they built this huge parking lot on top of a hill so that if the dams go, people can drive up there and, and be safe. That is a relatively new thing. My paper back in, I think it was either the late 90s or early 2000, actually had to take Hydro Quebec to court to get their emergency response plan for the community of Chisassabi. We went and got under access to information it took us a year. They fought it, saying that knowledge could be worth money. And we said, well, every other utility in North America makes their emergency response plans public. When we did finally get it, we found out the phone numbers to contact people and that were years out of date. This is the problem with Hydro Quebec is they make statements, they that are not, shall we say, verifiable in some cases. We as Crees do not want to see any more rivers dammed. We do not want to see any more of our environment affected that we depend on 
in order to live and to survive. And basically, the Inu are going to be fighting because they're divided. Some would like some of the dams, a lot wouldn't. So you're looking at a lot of court cases and stuff. With the amount of power that they're promising or trying to sell to both Massachusetts and New York, far exceeds any surplus that they have. So I know they'll be back and they'll probably come into the Cree territory again. This is why I'm speaking to you. And hopefully we can make a change because when I fought Great Whale, one of the things I always said was, I'm probably one of the few people you know trying to work themselves out of a job. And we did it. We, I did work myself out of a job. So this is winnable. This is something that we can do. You can save your rivers and you can make better choices for energy production. And I guess that's about all I have to say because we need to have some time so that uh, we can have some questions. I thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Will. Um, now we'll open it up for questions if anybody wants to either raise their hand or uh, jump in. Questions, ready? Where are, the, where are the questions? You're free to ask the questions or put it in the chat box. This is Meg. Okay, I see a question from uh, Teddy Williams to George. Do these dangers also exist when discussing offshore wind submarine cables? Oh, to a certain degree, but it's much more minimal because there's a wide open ocean uh, and they, they're not constrained in a tight place. There's no, once you're in the river, there's nowhere to go. And, you know, and fish spend eons of time traveling back and forth over them. So it is, the dangers are far greater in the river than out in the open ocean, far greater. This is Eric. Thank Jones. you. I'd like to add to that as well. Um, you know, as we are trying to go into this uh, green energy for the wind farms, which we support, um, the powerhouses are aging also in our country. And as a result, there are located mostly on deep water rivers like uh, the East River and uh, Gowanus. And uh, so we are working with these companies to help them uh, uh, channel the cable in from the wind farms to a more accessible area closer to the ocean. And I think that's a critical thing that uh, organizations should start pushing on this one. If we're gonna upgrade our, our clean energy, we should be upgrading our uh, substations as well. Uh, years ago, they were located on deep waters because they used both the water to cool the powerhouse and they used the deep water to accept the heavy fuel that they once burned. Um, you know getting them to get this closer to the South Shore, uh, where it can easily be connected and not have any impacts in the inland uh, waters would be a, a bonus to any great body. So that's just my point on that one. Uh, there's a question here, I think, to everyone. The very act of burying the cables will disrupt the surface, subsurface of the Hudson, which supposedly has much pollution in the form of mercury, PCB, et cetera, will be, will, will be suspended in the water column. Is that correct? Yeah, absolutely. And, yeah, and detailed in the report to the commission report. Hi, 
Hi, this is Meg. Um, just to jump in here for a question, I'm wondering if, Will, would you be willing to provide us with some history on Hydro-Quebec's first dams that were um, built starting in the late 60s and 70s, and what, was li what life was like in the Cree territory at the time? Okay. Um, well, growing up, um, there was no road into my community until I think I was about 12 or so. Um, and um, what happened was Robert Barassa decided to build his dam and they never, they never talked to us about it. And the only reason why we had a chance in a court case was the uh, 1898-1912 Boundaries and Extensions Act. Before, we were actually the, uh, you know, I have the Northwest Territories. Well, we were the Northeast Territories. So that was given over to Quebec in the condition that they would actually have to negotiate with us before doing anything within that territory. They ignored that. Uh, we found out through newspapers and radio and that, that they wanted to do the dams and we went out and we fought them. Our people were mostly living in the bush, um, subsistence living. There was very, very few other opportunities. Uh, we actually had the first meeting in my community of uh, the leaders of the Cree uh, at the time. And they decided but they would try to fight it. And we got assistance from basically anthropologists and some activists and whatnot. We won the first court case, the Maloof court case. It was overturned basically six days later by Quebec's uh, Superior Court. By the time we were told by our lawyers, by the time we would go to the Supreme Court where we would probably win, the dams would be built. So we signed the James Bay Northern Quebec Agreement. We created that one uh, with them. And it was very crazy in the communities. I mean, even after they were going to build it and that, they came around to tell us about it. It was kind of funny a few times because they, they had to have a Cree translator. And uh, when they were talking about how many megawatts it would uh, create, uh, everyone started laughing at the uh, after the Cree made his translation because we didn't have a number for that high. And so he just went lots, lots, and lots, and lots. But, you know, life was a lot different. Um, give me an example. My mother was basically born in the bush. She... Uh, her, her mother was pregnant and uh, traveling, traveled back by, they were traveling back to the community from the trap line uh, by canoes. And when she became, the men rushed ahead in their canoes. They made two tents and they got wood and everything else, uh, some fires, and then they came in. And the women went into one tent with, with uh, my grandmother and the men went into the other tent. And once they heard the first cry from the contraction, the men started beating a drum in time to the heart. And they sang all night until my mother was born. And she called all the women in there, her aunts, whether they were blood related or not, and all the men were her uncles. And since my mother didn't have enough milk, another woman was still giving milk, and she always called my mom her daughter. We shared everything, men. When I go hunting, even to this day, when I go on the spring goose hunt, I only kill about 15 geese. That might sound like a lot, but here's how it goes. There's a woman I know who has kids and she's got nobody to hunt for her. She cleans my geese for me. She gets every fifth goose. 
So that's three there. Then I give five to my parents. So that's eight geese. I'm left with seven. I come back down south. I give one to one of my good friends down here for her and her family. I give another one usually to either the Native Women's Shelter or we have some patients down here. And then I'll cook another one and I'll share it with the people at the office because these are the ways that we were brought up. Sharing and community and it's something that's still still there. And having the Hydro-Quebec come in, it's changed some of that. Like in my community now, I see classes where we didn't have classes before, the haves and the have-nots. Still share, but not in the same way that we used to, I guess. No. It's difficult to go out and, and see that there's not as much as there used to be in the past on the land and that it's been affected and that we have to be careful what we eat now. Does that uh, help out? That helps out a lot. And this is fascinating. And, you know, for some of us here, could you just, for example, describe where your community is and um, where it is in relation to the river and what it was like um, living in a summer camp and a winter camp um, in traditional times? Well, okay, uh, I wasn't in a winter camp because I went to a residential school. Uh, so I was there during the summers. But you remember your map of the transmissions, uh, the uh, what do you call it, the uh, length of the transmission lines? If you, yes. look, if you put it on and you look in the V. Say we're trying to look back to it here. Yeah, you see that go from the bottom of uh, James Bay, go right over and you see that big river, I mean that big lake. Wait, where, where, where are you? Uh, go, go, it, it's inside the V near the top. Okay. Oh yes. Okay. okay. That's like okay. that's like Mississippi. It's a hundred and some miles long, uh, twenty to thirty miles wide, with a chain of islands in the middle. Uh, that's mostly where I grew up. We did we did a lot of fishing, you know, and whatnot. It's it's a beautiful area, and. The Rupert's River actually comes out of it into uh, the one that was diverted. So, so um, thank you. So about 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 the Rupert River. So um, you talked about the first uh, James Bay Agreement. Um, what about the Rupert River and the diversion of that cluster of rivers um, sometime later? That was a difficult one. Um, basically, we were supposed to get benefits and the James Bay Northern Quebec Agreement was supposed to be implemented and the subsequent agreements, etc. But then they didn't implement them fully and they cut off some monies and that and it was getting harder in the communities. And so one of the, uh, the chiefs sat down and did the pay to braves deal which a lot of people didn't really agree with, but they seen we had to do something. And it's, there's a lot of people who disagree with that and say it was the worst agreement that was ever made. And then there's some that's promoted, you know? Uh, but those have really affected the land. I know in Muskaganish, there's a, one of my uh, partners comes from there and he said that, uh, that there's this place called Smoky Hill where they would go and um, the, uh, the whitefish would spawn there and they would uh, catch them out. We'd either catch them with like 
a handheld fishing net, you know, the ones you use to, when you're uh, fishing and casting, we would use that or else we would use a, a snare. It would be like a rabbit snare type of thing and catch them one at a time. And we'd smoke a bunch of them. And it was a place where people would go and spend time there with their families and they would share in all the work. That no longer exists. You know, there's a lot of places that don't exist that I know. Um, when they were building the Le Grand complex and I was a, a young student, uh, I went and I did archeology span there. And there was places I fished and did things. It's all underwater, you know, this one guy told me uh, he had canoed from uh, from further up north and was coming through, and he couldn't count on where he was going because all the maps were no longer good because they were filling up the reservoir. And he said the eeriest thing was, as you're going along, you see the trees underneath in the water. Mm. You know, All right, it is uh, almost 8.30. Is there anybody with a last minute question for any of our panelists? Yes, I'd like to ask a question. I, am I, yeah. is it okay? Yes. Yep, go ahead. Yes. Okay. I was involved with this. I very blessed to have met you, Will. It's good to see you after all these years. <laughs> um, so I'm intimately uh, involved with this issue since 1991. 